Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 35, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are fav- highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will, be, will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Amen. Lord, I ask for your power and grace to move upon your servant. Deal with me like only you can. Give me a word from on high, Lord, and don't allow me to try to preach the way I preach at 8 o'clock. Don't allow me to try to match or try to do better. Just allow me to bring a word like that is crafted for this hour right here. Lord, decrease me and increase your spirit. Make me bold, yet keep me humble at the same time. Allow me to bring a message behind this sacred desk. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you would take your seats, take your seats again. I'm preaching this sermon because of some of the weird doctrine I've been hearing on the internet and from people that I once respected as preachers and once looked at as though they were theologically sound. I'm not going to call any names, but I want to make sure that my people understand where Jesus and who Jesus is. So uh, you understand he was born of a virgin, and sometimes people don't understand this. So we're going to speak from the subject, let me explain. Amen. Let me explain explain. In looking at the virgin birth of Christ, man needs to think deeply and honestly. Both are necessary. Man must be honest and he must be engaged in concentrated thought. One question needs to be asked, why would God's son have to enter the world through a virgin? Or more simply put, why was Christ born of a virgin? Why was a virgin birth necessary? The birth of God's son required a miracle. He could not be born through the natural process as other men are. If he had been born as other men, his very birth would indicate that he was no more than a mere man. Very simply, any person who enters the world through a man and a woman is a mere man or mere woman. He or she can be nothing more. But this is not with Christ. Christ already existed. Therefore, if God willed to send his son into the world, he would have to choose another way. Can I break it down just a little bit for you? Superman wasn't born in this world, right? His daddy was Jorel. His name was Kyle-El. And because he was from the planet Krypton, he has superpowers. Come on, somebody. Jesus was not born of this world, but his manifested birth was here. And he had to be born here for legal authority. But let me get into the midst of the sermon first. Christ said in Hebrews 10, 5, a body hast thou prepared for me. He said it to God. He says the birth of God's son required a combined act on God's part and on woman's part. If God's son was to become a man and identify with men, he had to come through the process of conception through a woman. Why? Because a man can only come through a woman. The Bible says he who has not entered through the gate has only come to kill, steal, and destroy, which means, see, Satan was cast down from heaven, which means he doesn't have legal authority because he did not enter through the gate. In fact, the Bible says that we have authority over the angel. So why are you letting a fallen angel, why are you letting that slippery serpent take over your life, put you in debt, take over your job, cause you to not walk in healing, cause you to not walk in victory. That slippery serpent has no authority on this world, in this world, because he did not enter here legally. He was cast down from heaven. In fact, Jesus said, I looked down and he fell like lightning, cast down here. The angels even get jealous of us, Brother Briggs, because the angels said, what is man that you're mindful of him, that you made everything to be subject under his feet, yet he does 
not walk in the authority that you gave him. So the angel saying, God, if you gave us the power, we will walk in dominion. Why are so many people getting murdered even on our street? Because we don't walk in the authority we're supposed to walk in. You know why? Because we got too many people bickering about stupid stuff and crazy stuff and mad because they can't get their way and immature and not walking in the glorified power of God. It's time out from playing in church. I need you to walk in the authority that God has ordained you to walk in. He gave you power to heal the sick. He gave you power to cast out demons. He gave you the power to tread on serpents. Yet you worried about gas prices. Yet you worried about President Trump. Yet you worried about Republicans and Democrats. I need you to take the authority that God has given you that you have not been walking in. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he had to be born of a miracle. The question to be asked is why is it so hard to believe that God can cause Mary to miraculously conceive? Why is it so hard to believe that God exists? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if they can fertilize an egg with science, why God can't do what he do? Oh, come on, somebody. We got some mamas so crazy that they really think they the daddy. Yeah, yeah. They laid up with another woman talking about they the daddy because science and allowed them to make up some crazy stuff to make them think that they really a father. Come on, somebody. You better listen to what I'm saying. If science can do that, how in the world are you negating the power of my God? There's nothing impossible to God. It might be impossible with man, but all things are possible through God. Tell me you can make a test tube, baby, and God can't fertilize an egg with the Holy Ghost. You crazy? Yeah, y'all thought I was going to get commercialized because I was on TV. Baby, no, baby. I got to give you straight up no chase of the Holy Ghost field gospel because some of us done got so educated with our homiletics and hermeneutics and think we can exegete and, and do all this stuff with the text talking about how much we know and how we know about Epicureanism and how we know about Instantialism and how we know about Bonhoeffer and Tillich. But do you know Jesus? Come on, somebody. I know, I know you educated. I, I know you got your doctor degree. I, I know you in my seminary class at Hampton University, but I still must let you know, no matter how much Greek and Hebrew you know, if you don't know Jesus, it don't mean nothing. Oh, I'm trying to talk to somebody today. With God, nothing is impossible. Hebrews tells us that. Uh, the birth of God's son required a miraculous nature, both a divine nature and a human nature. He had to be born of a woman to partake of human nature. Look at this, Hebrews 2, uh, 14 through 18. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. See, he had to be born by a miraculous act of God so as not to partake of man's corruption. See, this was critical if we are to escape corruption and live forever. Think about it. Our faith must be in an incorruptible Savior if we are to be covered by his incorruption. If you can go to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 1 through 15 just to make a point. So help me out. Yeah, just stay awake and listen to me. Read along if you can uh, to yourself. I'm reading from the King James Version for my old school saints to make sure you know I know Jesus. The book 
of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Phares, and Zara and Thamar, and Phares begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Booz of Rachab, and Booz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesus. And Jesus begat da- and Jesse, I mean, Jesse begat David, Sorry, let me read that again so y'all won't think I'm crazy. And Salmon begat Booz of Rachab, and Booz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa. Don't get bored yet. And Asa begat Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias. And Ozias begat Jotham, and Jotham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekiel, and Ezekiel begat Manasseh, and Manasseh begat Amon, and Amon begat Joseph. I promise you I'm going somewhere. And Joseph begat Jochanas, and the brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jochanan begot Selethiel, and Selethiel begot Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel begot Abiab, and Abiab begot Elikim, and Elikim begot Azor. And Azor begot Zadok, and Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliud, and Eliud begot Eliezer, and Eliezer begot Nathan, and Nathan begot Jacob. But look at verse 16. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom born Jesus was called. See, every man begot the man, but when it got to Jesus, he didn't say Joseph begot Jesus. To let you know that man ain't got nothing with this, God has stepped in the midst of the lineage, walked down 40 and two generations, and rolled himself in the flesh, and came out, Emmanuel, God is with us. See, see, it's to show you that the Holy Spirit went through Moses, through, went through Mary. This trusts the vital fact that Jesus was not born of a man, but of the Holy Spirit. He was divine yet human through his conception in Mary. He was God man, fully God, fully man. The real significance of this is that God, he had the capacity not to sin. No other man since Adam has ever had the capacity for all other men have had human fathers and human mothers. So everybody had the capacity to sin. Why? Because your daddy made you. You feel me? See, a mother is a powerful, a woman's body is an amazing thing. Amen. Amazing. Let the heterosexual say amen. Amen. It's an amazing thing. Amen. But one thing about the woman's body is it's so amazing, not even on the outside, just on the outside, but on the inside. The woman has something in her called a placenta. And the placenta protects the baby and keeps the baby away from any outside influences. Nothing infiltrates the baby. No disease, not even the mother's blood. Nothing infiltrates the baby but the man's seed and blood. Right. So basically, everybody was born in sin because our fathers have a sinful nature just like we do. But God said, I need the perfect specimen to be born. So I'm going to put my DNA in it. Come on, somebody. So God said, I'm going to reach my I'm going to walk down 42 generations and roll myself in the flesh and come out as a human being. So nobody can taint the spirit or the power of me. When I come out, I'll be fully divine yet human. See, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. See, if you get bit by a copper snake, please don't go tell them that you get by, bit, bit by a rattlesnake because you're going to die. You got to have cause some of the antidote from the poison. From, uh, um, some of the antidote, some of the poison from the snake is used for the antidote. So Jesus had to come as a man because our flesh is our weakness. But he still had to be able to overcome it because you just can't take another rattlesnake if you got bent and put all the poison in it or you still really going to die more rapidly. So now he became enrobed in the flesh, but he's also God. So he's God 100 percent and man 100 percent, which means he has the capacity not to sin because he was not born in sin. However, Jesus Christ is a man also had the capacity to sin. He had the capacity not to sin and to sin. Ooh, do you feel the tension in the text? He suffered 
with the pull and strain and suffering of temptation as all men do. He could have willed to sin, but Jesus makes it clear in John 6, 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him that sent me. Look, that did not plan. He made sure we knew he didn't plan to sin. But Hebrews 4, 15 says, it lets us know he struggled. It says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. So he didn't have the, he had the capacity to sin, but he didn't sin. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Uh, you, you see, see uh, <laughs> Look, 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 look here. The thing about it is the reason why Jesus and God knows and he has compassion on you and has mercy on you because he understands you don't have the capacity to be perfect. He knows that you fall short of the glory of God. So the reason why he came, he enrolled himself in the flesh, came out and lived like you. So he understands that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you keep wondering why God forgives you all the times you mess up. He knows you can't do it by yourself. The problem is you need to realize that he's the one who's able to keep you from falling. And if you submit your life to him, you will be all right. Let me go on. And it says, Hebrews 5, 8 says, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. You know, the problem, Brother Sean, is we don't want to suffer. We want to know that God came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. We know. He want to give us every good and perfect gift. He don't, he don't withhold it. We want to take all the blessings, but we don't understand the suffering. He said, I will give you a hundredfold in this lifetime, but with persecutions. Oh, you're going to be blessed, but you're going to have to suffer. Jesus goes on further to say, if you don't suffer with me, you can't reign with me. Help me, old school. What we'll say is no cross, no. All right, then. You hear me. You feel me. He says, he, he never gave into temptation, though, even though he could be tempted. He came down to make sure he passed the test for us. But we'll get into that a little bit later. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became sin. See, uh, Reverend, Reverend Ely, see, the struggle is, we think that Jesus didn't want to go to the cross because he didn't want to take the nails. But nowhere in the text does it say he cried when they nailed him to the cross. Nowhere in the text says that he cried when they cracked his cranium with the, the, the thorns. Nowhere in the text does it say he cried when he walked down the way of suffering, holding his entrails in, which had been beaten till they began to hang outside. Theologians begin to say that he was carrying the cross, holding his intestines from falling out. That's how much he would beat him. But it never said that he cried or said a mumbling word. They plucked his beard out. They, they, they took him up naked on the cross. And see, some of y'all want to put a loincloth. That's why I don't even like the crucifix whatsoever. He was naked to cover your nakedness. That's what he was to cover your transgression because he was naked and went on the cross for you he covered your nakedness so but let me get that's a whole nother sermon that's easter but what i'm trying to tell you is this (laughs) he became sin that's when he became sin he don't like sin he hated sin he became what he hated for you he became your lion and my lion he became your hate and my hate he became your debauchery and my debauchery he became your nastiness and my nastiness that's what he did not like when he became sin he looked at God and said God why are you forsaking me for the first time he experienced separation for you and me God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. God does not like sin, and God deals with sin. But Brother Ross, what he did was he poured out all his wrath on Jesus on the cross, and he poured all the wrath of sin out. He took our place. He became sin for us. He took our place. And the thing about it is how bad Jesus is. Jesus, one time they were trying to kill him, Deacon Dawson, and he teleported like Captain Kirk without calling Scotty. <laughs> Didn't need nobody to beat him up. Eluded them. Every time they tried to kill him, he eluded him. So, Brother Easley, what began to happen was the devil kept trying to kill him more and more. Then all of a sudden he realized the wages of sin is death. Which means the wages of sin is death. Jesus never was supposed to die. But because he was going to the cross... He died. 
Grace was ushered in when he was on the cross. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. See, 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 grace was ushered in because, see, law is still here. He said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. And said, don't try, don't get it twisted. I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. I didn't come to do away with none of it at, at all. I came to fulfill the law. And some of us get twisted because we live in a time of grace and we think grace means you can do whatever you want to do. It gives you a license of sin. No, grace should make you want to do better because you appreciate the gift. You see what I'm saying? So this is what happens. Grace was ushered in, but Paul said, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Surely not. Where there's no repentance, there's no sacrifice. Don't try to do whatever you want because you feel like you're covered with the blood of Jesus and just sin all the time on purpose. No, you have to have a heart of repentance. The law is still here, but for a standard. The law is holy, but it can't make you holy. Why? Because you can't keep it. If you miss one part of the law, you miss it all. You miss it all. But Jesus, the only time, the thing you can cheat on and not really be counted for a sin is when you cheat off God's Jesus life. Jesus said, look, if you believe in me, I'll cover you. Believe in him and he'll cover you. So grace is here. The law is still here. The law is like gravity. Gravity, if you get on top of this building, I don't care how much you pray, don't jump. Gravity going to pull you down. I know y'all been watching Justice League and Superman and, 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 and all these people. You like Batman. You need a hook or something, all right? Don't, don't just jump. <laughs> you can't fly unless you got a utility belt like him. Don't do it. And I don't mean no hammer and nails. <laughs> you, you, you see what I'm saying? So, so, so if I, if, but gravity can be superseded by aerodynamics. See, if I get in an airplane, it's working right, I can supersede gravity. Although gravity is working against the plane, aerodynamics keep it above the law of gravity. The law is here, but Jesus has ushered in grace. And grace is a greater law than the law. It supersedes the law because as long as you come by the blood of Jesus, even when you mess up, as long as you repent, you're above the law. Come on, somebody. See, there's a thing called double jeopardy. You can't be tried for the same thing twice. And Jesus was tried for everything that you'd ever do. Everything that you've ever done, Jesus was already tried for. I know you thought you was the nastiest woman, the nastiest man on earth, but Jesus died for that mess too. No matter what you've done, because of his blood on Calvary, stop letting these men do you wrong and act like you ain't worth nothing. And stop letting these women do you the same way, act like you ain't nothing. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are bought with a price. You ain't free. You are bought with the precious blood of Jesus. He bought you. He paid for you. He ushered grace in for you. See, Jesus was intertestamental. See, intertestamental, he had his, he had, see, on the cross, I believe he had one hand going toward the Old Testament and one hand going toward the New Testament. And the reason why they put one nail through his legs is because he wanted to make sure that you knew he was bringing the Old Covenant and the New Covenant together. I used to think, Sister Ross, that Jesus was trying to show off when I was a young theologian. Why in the world, Brother Ely, would he tell the, the, the lepers to go show themselves to the priest? And as they were walking to the priest, they were walking to the priest, they began to be healed. Why was he doing it? He was doing it because they were still under the law and in order to be said you were healed the priest had to declare you healed so he stayed in divine order come on somebody but he still ushered in grace at the same time because he shouldn't even had to touch them or communicate with them oh y'all don't hear what i'm saying intertestamental the reason why the lady kept trying to touch the hem of his garment was because she understood if i can touch the hem of his garment i can be healed because the oil was in the garment so in the old testament she knew that if she could just touch the hem of his garment she'd be all right but that was the law and that was what should have happened but as a woman she wasn't supposed to touch a man especially if she had the issue of blood but because Jesus was intertestamental she allowed the law y'all don't hear me the law freed her yet grace He's intertestamental, bringing it all together, the old and the new. Stop running around here trying to abuse grace, you cheap grace person. Who said that? That was, uh, uh, that was Henry Bonhoeffer. He said, stop going around looking for cheap grace. In his book, Cults of Discipleship, read it. It's a hard read, but read it. I'm telling you right now, some of us keep going for cheap grace. 
He died. He went through everything for you. He went through scientific stuff just to make sure the devil couldn't accuse you. He was born of a woman so he could have legal authority. He was not born of a man. He was not given birth by man. But why? He, he, of course, he wasn't given birth by man. But he was not conceived or he was not the seed wasn't planted by man. So that means sin was not in him. Then he went to the cross to make sure everything was together. He became the ultimate sacrificial lamb. Now, the devil, y'all thought I lost my place. Figured out, if I put him on the cross, I usher in grace. So he came in Peter and said, don't go to the cross. And Jesus said, get you behind me, Satan. The joke on you, bro. Uh-huh. If you would have just let me live, everybody would have went to hell but me. But because you want to be grown and send me to the cross... I'm going to save everybody. And then, Brother Smith, he got the audacity to say, oh, hold on, I know y'all beat me, but no man, take my life. I lay it down. You can't really kill me. Y'all didn't beat the Falcons. They laid it down. They wanted y'all to be able to play, play the Patriots again. <laughs> we laid it down. We gave it to y'all. We felt sorry for you. <laughs> Laid it down. Jesus said, no man take my life. I lay it down. He was a boy knowing he had to die. The birth of God's son required the birth of a perfect nature. Why? Because a perfect life needed to be lived. Righteousness, that is, perfection needed to be secured. An ideal life that is a perfect righteous life had to be lived so that it could stand for and cover all men in perfection and in righteousness. Honest thought confesses that no man has been perfect. No man. We all fall short of the glory of God. But God acted. God did everything to secure righteousness and perfection for man. He took every step and performed every act necessary to save his people from their sins and from death. He did it from the beginning to the end, from birth to exaltation. See, this is the whole thing. He sent his son into the world, not through a man and a woman, but through a miraculous act of his own upon the Virgin Mary. See, we always worry about how did Moses and Abraham go to heaven. See, Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. See, you keep getting your little twisted, finite, chronological thinking self. See, that's why people get mad because I'm younger than them and I'm the pastor. Some deacons leave and get mad because how this young man going to tell me what to do? God don't care about who he gives authority to or about what age because he don't deal with chronological. Because truth be told, we were all made at the same time. It's just when we were pushed out into history, time, and space. Jesus was already created from the foundation of the world. He had already been crucified. So God already had a plan. He had already been crucified before he even went to the cross. Oh, y'all don't hear me what I'm saying. He had already been bruised for your transgression. It had already happened, but God had already planted up in his mind. He does not look at linear time and space. He's interstellar. He sees past present and future all at the same time and he plugs you in when he needs you to be plugged in when you mature enough to handle what it is he's giving you stop looking at your chronological age yeah, because you got gray hair on your head don't mean you fit to lead God made my hair gray just for y'all crazy self. Had to make my hair gray just so y'all could listen. It was crazy. I grew my beard out and my hair grew gray. Ooh, he can grow a beard now. He old enough to lead us. I can grow a beard. I just shaved it off. Huh. Silly Christian. Age is for kids. <laughs> Jesus. He, he sees it all at the same time. You, you, you way older than you think you are. You were already created before he pushed you out your mother's womb. He already knew you. Oh, y'all hear me? 
He sees all time at the same time. Past, present, and future. He just waiting on you to be ready to plug you in. Jesus had already been crucified, but he decided to put him in the time and space when he put him out there to make sure he brought the fruition in this time and space where he had already planned. I'm killing y'all right now. Let me get this going. As God's man, Christ was able to consummate both the human and divine. He had the capacity and innate power not to sin. Therefore, his godly nature empowered him to live righteously, never doing wrong and always choosing and doing right. By living a sinless life, Christ was able to secure righteousness, the ideal righteousness that will cover and stand for all men. As God man, number two, Christ was able to to bear the sins, the judgment of sin of all men. When he died, he died as a perfect and ideal man. Therefore, his death is able to cover and stand for all men and women, of course, because an innocent man was put on the cross. All sins were covered by his unjust death. As God, man, Christ was able to arise from the dead. Note the phenomenal words in Romans 1, 3, and 4. It says, his God's, his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He lived a perfect and holy life by which he came, uh, became the perfect and ideal man. Therefore, his resurrection covers and stands for every man. Number four, as God, man, Christ was exalted to sit at the right hand of the Father to live, eter- in eternity, e- e- to live eternally in the heaven dimension of being in God's very own presence as the perfect and ideal man, his exaltation into the heaven or spirit dimension is able to blaze the path of, to heaven for every man. He is the forerunner into heaven for every man. His exaltation as the ideal man covers and stands for the exaltation of everybody. Look. He blazed a trail. You know how you walk through somebody, you might see somebody y'all that a trail is blazed there because people been walking and all of a sudden it's clear because the same people been same people been walking around it and other people just been following it. See, it's hard to be a trailblazer. That's why people with apostolic anointing understand what I'm saying. Everybody talk about you, then after you do it, they copy you. Everybody want to play basketball. Now, you know, y'all get that when you go home. But the thing about it is. The amazing thing is that Jesus blazed a path. He came down blazing a path from heaven to earth. Came down in divine nature from heaven to earth. Because you know you're from heaven, right? That's really where you're from. Huh? To be absent from the body, to be present with God. That's where you were created. So he blazed a path from heaven to earth, coming out in the womb of Mary. Then he blazed a path after he died and went up on a cloud as a man to heaven. So he was God's only begotten son. A path was blazed to heaven to make it easier for you to get there. If you couldn't make it, look at that Leviticus, baby. You didn't know if you needed to get a turtle dove, two French hens. You didn't know if you needed a partridge in a pear tree. You didn't know if you needed a bullock or ox. And then if you sacrificed something that was messed up on the inside, God would send you straight to hell because you didn't have the right sacrifice. Come on, somebody. But now you have the perfect sacrificial lamb. Not only do you have a sacrificial lamb, you have a priest. A priest in his to the cross for you. He was the lamb and the priest and the sacrifice oh y'all don't hear what I'm saying just to make sure Satan couldn't challenge nothing he did he kept everything in the order of the law born of a woman that's why the antichrist is going to try to come be born of a woman because he can have legal authority on the earth born of a woman but wasn't born through a man's seed so therefore he was not corrupted even though he was made flesh his flesh did not have dominion over him because his spirit was imparted by the holy ghost let me see the reason why he was born of a virgin was to show you you didn't need nobody to be with you when I go to a church conference, Deacon Ross, I don't be caring if somebody stick with me or not. Everybody come, I love you, you know I love you. Well, shut up, one church conference then. Every church conference, you come fussing with me, talking about you love me, then leave me alone. Every time. I don't care if you're getting mad, I'm talking. Back to the Holy Ghost. I don't care who with me in a board meeting, I don't care who with me in the city. You know why? Because God works through virgins. 
Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Y'all, I ain't saying you got to be a virgin, but what he's showing you is he was born of a virgin to show you that you don't need nobody but the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. I'm all man, baby, but God impregnates me with vision. I don't worry if you with me or not. I keep walking through my first, second, and third trimester until God bursts the vision up out of me. I'm telling you right now, if you ain't with me, I don't care. God has sent me who he need to send me as long as I just depend on the Holy Ghost and nobody else. I don't care if you're with me or against me. The Holy Ghost is always with me. Even if I make my bed in hell, he's right there. Some of y'all looking for too many friends. You're looking for too many helpmates. You're looking for too many teammates. You're looking for too much help and support. Until you learn how to just depend on the Holy Ghost, God ain't going to send you nobody. Yeah, I need help. Yeah, I appreciate my deacons. Yes, I appreciate my trustees. But if you ain't with me every now and then, I don't care. Because all I need is the Holy Ghost. He'll draw all men unto me who's supposed to be with me as long as I'm serving him. I am just want to preach to myself. So... Reverend Maxwell, what are you telling me? I'm trying to tell you that you don't have to worry about the next person in your cubicle. You ain't got to worry about nobody on your job messing with you because you're covered with the blood-stained banner of Jesus. Every time they tried to mess you up and take your job, they co- God covered you. Oh, you don't hear me? He covered you. He covered you even when you thought you weren't being covered. He walked you through the valley of the shadow of death. I know you thought you was all that in a bag of chips, but it was God walking I I just want to preach Jesus. The birth of God's son required the creative word of God. God created the world by simply speaking the word. God always creates by the power of his word and the power of his word alone. Therefore, when God chose to create a body for his son, he created that body by simply speaking the word. And the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You better watch her. Stop letting your people talk about you. You're fearfully and wonderfully me. If they don't call you what God calls you, just find yourself in the word. I'm fearfully. I'm wonderfully made. I'm the head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. The lender and not the borrower. Hey! He who began a good work in me shall finish it. Jesus. It's the same with the new birth or recreation of man's spirit. It's by the word of God. God simply speaking the word. The man is born again. The act of spiritual birth or the recreation is not seen, felt, or touched. Nothing physically happens. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23 says... For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Some of y'all got baptized, but you didn't feel no different because you won't feel nothing. It's simply because you obey the word. See, see, even Jesus got baptized and, and, and John said, I, why are you letting me baptize you? I don't deserve to touch the shoelaces on your sandals. I, I don't deserve to unlatch the buckle of your sandals. I can't even touch your feet. I, I can't even give you a pedicure or a manicure. I can't even touch you. Jesus said, it's the word said it. I got to do it. So stop trying to rationalize why you got to get baptized. See, us millennials don't understand, but us old school know when daddy said do something, he didn't try to explain it. He said, "Uh uh-huh, do it because I said so. That might be oxymoronic because what I'm preaching about is let me explain. 
But I'm trying to tell you why he's omnipotent and omniscient. He knows everything. So stop trying to outthink God. He said be baptized so you can be the remission of your sins. Why? Baptism is just an outward expression of an inward conviction that you're doing. And he want to make sure that you're confessing before men with an outward act of baptism that you really accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Ah, I'm boring some people, but I don't care. Uh, the birth of God's son required the virgin birth because Christ is the only begotten son of God. Now, he's the only begotten son, the only one born uh, as, as, as from a woman of him, not the only son. You are sons and daughters because you adopted. You ain't illegitimate. You adopted, but you, you weren't born God. All right. All right. All right. Just trying to make sure. <sighs> He's God's only son who possesses all the nature and fullness of God himself. Philippians 2, 6 and 7 says, who, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. <clears throat> Colossians 2, 9 says, <clears throat> for in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Oh, see, see what I'm trying to tell you is this. Uh, see, 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 he, everything about God is in Jesus. <clears throat> so if you don't know El Shaddai, is God above all other God? Just say Jesus. If you don't know Jehovah Shalom is your peace, just say Jesus. If you don't know Jehovah Nisi is your victory, just say Jesus. If you don't know Jehovah Rophe is your healer, just say Jesus. If you don't know El Elyon and, and Elohim, if you don't know Jehovah Mekidesh, if you don't know all them words, just say Jesus. You ain't got to know all this theology. As long as you know Jesus, you will be all right. Because the fullness of the Godhead bodily is in Jesus. See, I, this is why I got to help somebody because somebody was telling me on the internet that Jesus wasn't God. Now, Jesus and I, yeah, exactly. Jesus then told you who he is. <laughs> oh, God. Yes. Oh, God. Epic moment right there. Yes. They said it. That Jesus wasn't God. God could have said that he's in three persons. God the Father, which is the creator and the judge and the judge. God the Son, who is the advocate for your sin, but he's the standard in which you will be judged by. And God the Holy Ghost, which is the Holy Spirit, who will lead you into all truth, a part of himself that lives in you. So stop trying to let people tell you who you ain't and how you can't do this because you are fearfully and wonderfully made and God himself dwells in you. See, that's why. Let me talk to my old school people. Uh, see, my old school people, you got to understand this. I'm the same age as you. The Holy Spirit lives in me. The Holy Spirit the same age. He was there before time ever was. And I was already created. He just decided to push me out a little bit later than you. So what you need to get straight in your mind at all, y'all, is that God has put me here and I have the authority to be here and God wants to use me to bless you. But some of y'all be so hard headed because you want to go by your own spirit and not the Holy Spirit. All right, back to my sermon. See, this is why I need to make sure that y'all understand this. He split himself up to make sure, because see, I understand why God got to split himself up. That's why I'm glad I got an assistant pastor now, so when people ain't doing right, let him fire folk. Because it's hard to be the pastor and the judge, and you know what I'm saying? Anyway, God is three persons. But let me say, there is no salvation apart from his being the son of God. See, see, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just go back to this. Let me make sure you get this. Let me just give it. His birth had to be different. He had to enter the world differently from others. For he is different by the very nature of his being. He had to enter the world in such a way as to proclaim his divine nature, yet in such a way that would allow him to partake of human nature. This is critically important. His birth had to involve both the act of mankind and God himself. Why? Because the son of God had to be proclaimed to be the son of God. There is no salvation apart from his being the son of God. There is no salvation apart from his being proclaimed to be the son of God. Man can be saved only if the son of God is, only if he exists, and only if he's proclaimed. 
The son of God must exist and we must hear of him if we are able to be saved. He and his message are both essential. His virgin birth proclaims him to be the only begotten son of God, the only son sent into the world by the direct and miraculous intervention of God. I love people of other religions, but I just believe that the Bible is true. The birth of God's son required a second Adam. A second man, born just like the first Adam by the word of God using nat- natural substance. Born to become what the first Adam failed to become, the representative man, the ideal man, the pattern, the perfect one, in whom all men could find their representative, their ideal, their pattern, their perfection. Born to be what the Adam, the first Adam failed to be, the man who always chose to love and obey God in all things, therefore passing on the nature of the ideal righteousness and perfection that can stand for and cover all men. Born to become what the first Adam failed to pass on to man, the way to God, the truth of God, and the life of God, which all men can trust and follow. Born to offer what the first Adam failed to pass on to man, the nature of righteousness and life both life abundant and life eternal he did all this for you handled everything so the devil couldn't come accuse you of nothing covered every basis so he wouldn't find a loophole to take you to hell died on the cross for you he even he even set the story up you know, you know how some preachers, I know I ain't as good as them, they can set the story up. Je- Je- Jesus, first of all, he said, I'm going to be born of a virgin. First of all, he, didn't be, he wasn't born of no single woman because you know they wouldn't have believed that. Uh-huh, the Holy Ghost. <laughs> the Holy Ghost, man, this girl crazy. And he, he was born of a woman. He couldn't be born of a married woman. Why? Because a married woman, you know, Hopefully she ain't no virgin. Well, hopefully she was a virgin in it, but you know, hopefully she ain't no virgin no more, you know. If so, I'm, I'm, I'm let uh, Rev over there counsel y'all on that one. Hey. <laughs> but he was born of a woman in an expelled state who was in Jewish custom engaged. And that way, what they do is, they, 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 uh, for a year, they can't touch each other, but they trying to get to know each other. And sorry, women, back then they checked and made sure you was a virgin. So they knew she was a virgin. Now, all of a sudden, Mary pregnant. But Joseph had just checked. <laughs> Joseph like, what's up now? Hold on, hold on. Uh, and you know what I'm saying? And that's why I love God. God said, I'm just, I know I got to go down here and talk to him myself, Deacon Dawson. Now, he ain't going to believe. Hey, come here, come here. Come. Let, me, let, me holler at you. let me holler at you, Joseph. Look here, man. You know, the wife didn't cheat on you. The Holy Ghost got her pregnant. And they ain't even taking the story because I'm sure that conversation still, even though it was God, come on now, it wasn't just that easy. Uh, fact, it must not be easy because she left and went to Elizabeth's house. She came back. Hold on. Joseph ain't feeling this. That's why I'm telling you, God will use you even when other people closer to you still don't believe what your story is. Oh, y'all know what I'm saying? I don't care if you believe my story or not. I know when God changed me. I know when God touched me. Yeah, I still fall every now and then. I might fall more than I should fall, but I know I met Jesus on the way to whatever day he met me on. That's how you got to be. She left and went to Elizabeth's house. Now, that miracle ain't happening no more. So if you're talking about a virgin, when you go to Elizabeth House, you just stay there, sister girl, or you're going to be in trouble. Just stay over there. Stay at Elizabeth House. Don't come back. <laughs> but what I love about God is he prepares the natural state as he prepares the spiritual state. See, he was preparing married to be married and, and ready for the birth and in an expired state. He was showing you that he was in a period of preparation. So not only is he pre- preparing uh, uh, Mary and Joseph to, 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 to be married, he's marrying, he's getting prepared for Christ to marry the church and make, oh, y'all hear what I'm saying? He's preparing a way for him. He does it in the natural to show you what's going on in the spiritual. 
He was preparing a way. Galatians 4, 4 says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. He made him under the law. There's no way for him to fulfill the law if he was not born under the law. That's why I don't understand why people don't know how to submit to pastor, submit to CEO, submit to principal. Because if God himself can submit himself under his own law, if God brought himself into subjection under men to make sure that he took care of you, but with your pride for self, that's why some of y'all stay broke all the time because you don't know how to submit. That's why some of y'all still at the same rank you was in in the army. The minute you came in, you only went up one or two ranks. Why? Because you don't know how to submit to authority. He submitted to the authority of his own law. Now, Matthew 5, 17 through 20 says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, unto heaven and earth disappear not the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen will be any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside on one the... Uh, one of the least of these commands and teaches others according will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, I ain't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. He was born under the law, but he was born to liberate you from the law. He understood you couldn't do it on your own, so he came and did it and lived perfectly. Yet, even though he lived perfectly, he allowed himself to be crucified so that all the wrath of sin could be poured out on him so that you may not perish but have everlasting life. He did all that for you, and you worried about what somebody called you. You worried about people calling you out your name. You're worried about racism. You're worried about Republicans and Democrats. Why? If my God stepped out of heaven and rolled himself in the flesh to fulfill something I couldn't do on my own just to make sure he poured all the wrath out on himself so that I can be saved and I'm supposed to worry about you, you better talk to the hand. You better get me behind me. People are like, how you, how he called to be a pastor? I don't know. I don't care. That's what he called me to do. You got to get to the point where you understand that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And you stop worrying about everybody else's opinion. The problem is the people that's talking about you worried about themselves and they're insecure because the only way they can live is vicariously through your life. When people talk about you, you know what? They want your life. They want to be you. Remember that movie, Single White Female? There's some single black females and single black males and single white males and everything. <laughs> he made you fearfully and wonderfully. It doesn't matter who's against you. He's always there with you. He's an ever and present help. He was born of a virgin just to make sure he was born in a sinless state, woke, got out of Mary's womb as a man, lived perfectly, allowed himself to go to the cross so the wrath of sin would be poured out on him, made sure that the king and the, and the, and the, and the judge and Pontius Pilate didn't put him to death because if he would have been put to death by them, it would have been an execution. He made sure the high priest offered him up as a sacrifice. Oh, y'all better hear what I'm saying. God went through all that technical stuff, took notes and everything just to save your soul. You better stop letting people talk about you. Stop letting people put you down. Stop letting people tell you what you can't be. I'm a child of the king. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm blessed in the valley and blessed in the field. I am great. I am somebody. Stop letting people put Put you down stop letting people put you down if Jesus did all that for you 
And if there was no me, he still would have did it for you. And if there was no you, he still would have did it for me. If Jesus went through all that to line everything up scientifically and theologically and presented himself as a drink offering for you. What you worried about? You got to go back to your roots. See, when you don't really believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, you don't believe in the other power. We don't believe that he was raised from the dead. You don't believe in that. You know why I don't worry about nobody talking about me and coming against me? I don't worry about the church coming. I don't worry about all this stuff. If Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, why I need to worry about you? If he conquered death, he can conquer you. Worrying about you and your pharisaic opinions? Worrying about you coming with no facts? Bringing stuff that don't make sense because you ain't read? But want to come at me? I don't care. You need to be like that on your job. You need to understand that I don't care how many people in the next cubicle talk about me. I know you can't handle me. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You know some people that tried to kill you, that tried to put roots on you, that tried to come against you, but God has been covering you. Yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, his rod and his staff has been covering you the whole way through. You don't even know what God has delivered you out of. Stop whining about what you're going through right now. It's some stuff God is covering you from that you ain't even seen yet. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Some of y'all, God has been putting your enemies to sleep every time they tried to mess with you. Every time they came with you like a flood. They're like, how in the world did she do it? It's God in you. He is my feast of weeks. He is my sacrificial lamb. And see, y'all need to understand what I'm saying theologically. The sacrificial lamb, when they put the blood on the post, he is that. You don't need that no more. You don't need the feast of weeks. You don't need to go through all that eating and celebrating and fellowshipping just to get with Jesus. He's already there. You don't need a blood sacrifice. You don't need the Levitical law. Jesus did all of it for you. He's the great I am. But you don't need to call him by all the names like the Jews did. The Jews had to know Jehovah Shalom was his peace. They had to know Jehovah Rapha was the healer. They had to know Jehovah Nisi was the victory. They had to know Jehovah Mekiz was the sanctifier. They had to know El Shaddai was a God above every other God. They had to know all the meanings because they had to know all the names of God to call him what they needed. But now all you need is Jesus. Colossians says he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that's in God is in him. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the author and finisher of your faith. This is what you need to know. See, some of y'all worried about people on your job. But you can't worry about them. You know why? Because what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hey, I know that it's Jesus who has my back. I don't care if you're with me or against me. It's his redeeming blood. It ain't my check. It ain't my job. It ain't the president. It ain't Obama. It ain't Trump. It ain't liberation. It ain't gay rights. No, it ain't at all. You know why? Because we tired of bringing worldly mess in the church. And till you lift up Jesus above all, all of your mess. You won't understand what I'm talking about. It ain't. That spirit. I got to say this and I know I'm finished. I'm going to open up the door to church. Who I feel it. That Jezebel spirit is coming down. I feel it. I feel it. That Jezebel, I 
Absalom spirit that has been keeping this church hostage for so long has been coming down and I feel it coming down right now. Oh, that justifying spirit that think that you were born certain ways is coming down right now. God ain't made you no homosexual. God ain't made you no lesbian. God ain't made you. That's your mind struggling with yourself. That's you. You need to bring all them thoughts into submission of the Holy Ghost and under the blood of Jesus. God ain't called you to be broke. That's your mindset. Conquer that. We're about to be liberated. Oh, God. I, can, I don't know if you feel it. I don't know if you feel it. But can I get a coaching organ going right now? Can I get some Holy Ghost in here? Don't send me to a funeral right now. I need some spirit in here. I need some Holy Ghost in here. Can I get some spirit in here? I'm calling down Jezebel. I'm calling down Absalom. I'm calling down religious spirit. I'm calling down tradition. Hey! This ain't no funeral. This a Holy Ghost party. And when a Holy Ghost party gets started, it don't stop. Hey! Hey! Release debt. I bind it in the name of Jesus. I bind sickness. I bind disease. I bind it in the name of Jesus. Oh, as we bind those spirits, we release spirits of peace, joy, deliverance. Oh, shunned them about candid of Hey, hey, Holy Ghost, you're welcome in this place. We open up the heavens for you, we open up the church for you. Holy Ghost, you're welcome in this place. You're welcome in this place. Holy Ghost, we need you. Holy Ghost, we want you. Break down the burdens and the yokes. Hey. Ah. Ha. Woo. Jesus. Jesus. Put his name on it. Whatever you're going through, say Jesus. If you're sick, say Jesus. Hey. His name. Woo. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, you're welcome. Holy Ghost, you're welcome. Holy Ghost, you're welcome. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Yes. Holy Ghost, yes.